Peter Beal, given by the size of this room, it looks like he doesn't really need much introduction, but I'll do one anyway. So he is the director of the Berkeley Robot Learning Lab and the co-director of the Berkeley AI Research uh, AI Lab. Um, he has, in, in the time that I've been following robotics, amazingly been able to make three, in my mind, big splashes in the robotics field. The first was with autonomous helicopter ac acro acrobatics. The second was with robot laundry folding. And the third is with this new wave of deep reinforcement learning. And Peter has been uh, the person behind each of those uh, projects. Um, he also is very committed to teaching, so his Intro to AI class has had over 100,000 students take it through uh, edX, um, as well as the deep reinforcement learning and deep unsupervised learning classes have provided valuable resources for many people. He's also a co-founder of uh, three companies, GradeScope, Covariant, and Berkeley Open Arms, as well as the winner of many awards, such as PK's uh, NSF Career, ONR YIP, um, NS, uh, DARPA, YFA, and PR35. So uh, without further ado, uh, let's all welcome Peter. Thank you, Dave, for the nice introduction. Of course, a lot of the work is really done by uh, students and postdocs, and uh, always looking for more students and postdocs. Uh, if you're graduating anytime soon, uh, feel free to reach out. Now, this is a video that's been inspiring me for the past roughly 10 years. It's a video made by Eric Berger, Keenan Weirbeck in 2008, showing the PR1 robot, predecessor of PR2, um, doing a lot of the chores that many of us wish robots could be doing for us. Uh, but there's a catch. And the catch is that the robot is being tele-operated. Eric is sitting inside a harness, puppeteering this robot around, orchestrating every single motion the robot is making. But what it shows is that the missing piece to have this in our homes is essentially the software. Can we make robots smarter? If we can do that, then it could do this without Eric behind the scenes. So, now, when I say need to make it smarter, um, there's a lot of very interesting directions that I think we need to make progress on to get there. And so what I want to do here is hit upon a few of those directions, not all of them. I'm going to hit upon the first column here, um, but the second column is just as interesting. Um, we only have so much time, uh, where I think uh, we, need, we already made some progress and we'll need a lot more progress to get those robots doing what you saw in that video on their own. The first one I hit upon is few shot reinforcement learning. Let's first take a step back and talk about reinforcement learning. So in reinforcement learning, there is an agent. The agent interacts with the world. Uh, after interaction, gets to see the new state of the world or maybe just a sensory observation of the world. And this process repeats over and over and over. And during this process, there's something called reward. And the agent is supposed to maximize expected reward over time. For example, maybe a cooking robot, the reward would relate to having a good meal and not doing anything bad in your kitchen. Now, this process here, the idea is not just that the agent interacts with the world and executes, but actually needs to learn from scratch, has not done anything ever before, and learns from scratch how to do well in this environment. And actually, there's been quite a bit of success. So here's an example of um, reinforcement learning in action. This robot is being rewarded for making progress off to the right. Um, and we see that over time, repeated trial and error, it figures out how to stay up, run off to the right, and maximize reward. Now, of course, the beauty of a learning approach to this is that you can swap in different robots or different tasks. You don't have to write any new code. You can run the same code, and then for the new task, train a new neural net to control the robot. This is one example, but actually there's been quite a few success stories over the past few years. Success in learning to play Atari games, a wide range of simulated robotic skills. Doesn't have to be a humanoid, can be a lion. Um, video games like Dota 2, the game of Go, um, real robots learning to manipulate objects, and then this kind of very weird robot, which is a NASA robot that's essentially rods and cables. You can control it to roll uh, towards a destination. So if I ask a question, what can reinforcement learn? Um, the answer would be mastery in a very wide range of domains. But if I ask a question, are we building intelligent systems? That's actually a different question. Because I mean, imagine uh, you have a friend and your friend goes to school 
and goes to first grade for 20 years and then is the best student in first grade. In some sense, that's what we're seeing here. Reinforced learning takes a really long time and then becomes really good, but intelligence is also about how fast you acquire new skills. This is measured for the Atari games. So what you see here is some statistics on how long it takes a reinforced learning algorithm, double DQN, um, to learn to play in a new Atari game. And it takes 115 hours of experience to get to the level you must get out in 15 minutes. So there's a massive gap in learning speed. So how are we going to bridge this gap? Well, one observation could be that humans might sure play this Atari game for the first time, but they've done many other things before in their lives and through evolution in other people's lives. So can AI similarly exploit past experiences to be ready to learn more quickly as a consequence? What would this look like? Well, you'd have to generate some past experiences for the system. So your ultimate agent, which should be learning fast, should first be exposed to other environments, A, B, C, D, and so forth, gather experience there, not necessarily experience to master those environments, though it's okay to do that, but more importantly, gather experience that makes it ready to learn fast in a new environment in the future, let's say Z. So that's the high-level picture of why we might think this is possible. How can we formalize this? So here's an objective that captures this. We're going to try to find an agent which is parameterized by some parameter vector theta. And this agent is supposed to maximize expected reward, much like in regular reinforcement learning. But the difference is now, when you look at the first expectation, it's over environments the agent is being dropped in. So agent gets dropped in an environment at random, then gets capital K trajectories of experience in that environment, and then gets dropped in a new environment. And this repeats over and over and over. Capital K equal 2 is shown over here in the interaction graph of the agent with the environment. So after two episodes, it's moved to a new environment. If an agent can get high reward under this objective, it means that in just two episodes, it's collecting high reward. And so it means it's learning quickly to adapt to whatever new environment it's being put into. Now, how do we find such an agent? Well. We can actually directly maximize this objective. We can try to find an agent that we cannot take the exact expectation over all possible environments. We can take an approximation, a sample estimate on training environments, and maximize the agent's performance across those. Now, you might say, will that work then? Well, it's a bit like supervised learning. Supervised learning, you have labeled examples you train on, and then others you have to test on later. And the hope is that if you do well on the training examples, you later do well on the test examples. Here, it's training environments, and if you can adapt quickly to training environments, hopefully you can adapt quickly to test environments. Now we need to choose how to represent the agent. Um, an agent can be represented in many ways. You can imagine it's a computer program, or I mean, in reality these days often a grad student writing code that's part of the agent. But let's say you want to do it fully automated. What do you want this agent to be? Well, it could be a recurrent neural net. And the reason that could make sense is because a recurrent neural net can represent any smooth computer program if it's large enough. So any program can be represented, including hopefully a program that leads to fast learning in new environments. Going under the hood, different weights in the RNN means different RL algorithm encoded in it, and a different prior over possible environments the agent could be dropped into. Different activations correspond to whatever has been learned in the current environment. Dropped in a new environment, activation gets reset to zero, and then picks up on whatever is special about that new environment. How do we train this? This objective can be trained with regular reinforcement learning. It's actually, if you have reinforcement learning code, you can just drop this in there, and you can run the same code. It's just a reinforcement learning objective, with the difference being that we're going to dropping into new environments rather than dropping new initial states. That's the only difference, right? Normally you'd set in a new initial state, now you drop it in a new environment. Another subtle thing that happens here, and not typically in reinforcement learning, is that the agent, the recurrent neural net, explicitly observes the reward. So it sees observation, action it took, but also reward. And so it can internalize things about the reward directly into the recurrent neural net. Whereas usually the reward is only fed to an outside algorithm. How to evaluate this? Um, well, 
There's a very canonical reinforcement learning problem called bandits. In a military arm bandit problem, there's multiple arms to pull. Each arm has a different probability of paying off, but you don't know the probabilities ahead of time, so you have to go explore and see which one might pay off with higher probability and then exploit. So that's the core reinforcement learning aspects, exploration, exploitation. At the same time, it's very simple. The state of the system doesn't change. After you pull, all the probabilities stay the same for every bandit. So it's a stateless system in that regard. Because it's so simple, people have designed, by just thinking, hand designed optimal algorithms for this kind of problem. So the question we can ask, if we run learning to reinforce and learn by exposing an agent to many, many bandit situations, will it internalize in the weights of the recurrent neural network something that will allow it when faced with a new bandit problem to solve it near optimally? So there's a few of these asymptotically optimal uh, human designed ones. The one that performs best is Gittins, and we see that RL squared learning to reinforce and learn uh, is on par uh, to Gittins indices. Now you might say, well, bandits we already know how to solve, so it's really just a proof of concept that in principle we can do this. How about a harder problem? So a canonical robotics problem is navigating a building you've never been in before. Imagine you're dropped in this building here, and all you see is this first person view, but no access to the map. The map is just here, so you know what the environment is, but the agent has no access to the map. You get a camera view, then you can keep going straight, steer two degrees to the left or two degrees to the right. And then the process repeats. And somewhere in that maze, there will be some kind of treasure shown in red. In this case, it's over here. So in this case, you should be able to recognize it's in front of you and run towards it and collect it. Now, this is essentially SLAM, which is a canonical robotics problem. You need to map out where you are. And then you actually also need to take your own action. So normally in SLAM, somebody joysticks the robot around, and the robot builds the map and localizes itself. Here, it also needs to control itself. So if you just randomly walk around in this kind of space, this is what you get. And so not very good. If you drop the system in many, many, many past environments, which are all of a similar type, but then present it with a new one it's never been in before, and again, it does not have access to the map, it just has access to this view right now, let's see what it'll do. What do we hope it would do? Well, the treasure is here, but it doesn't know that. We can't hope for it just run to the treasure, it has no map for that. What we can hope for is that it would start running down hallways, look around corners, see if it sees a treasure, and if it sees a treasure, run towards it, collect it. And then if it gets a second episode in the same environment, it should remember essentially the layout of that environment from having run around in it once before and go to the treasure right away. And that's indeed what we see happen. It's running down hallways, looking around corners, and ultimately seeing the treasure, finding it, getting dropped a second time, remembers enough inside the hidden units of the recurrent neural network to go there again. So that was few shot reinforcement learning. It's the idea that you would, from past experiences, become ready to learn more quickly from a small number of episodes in a new environment that's for now similar to past environments, but definitely not the same. Second thing I want to touch upon is leveraging simulation. What's the motivation for simulation? Compared to the real world, um, well, simulated data collection is less expensive, faster and more scalable, less dangerous, easier to label. In fact, the simulator has the labels built in. So a lot of advantages. So why are we not doing everything in simulation? Well, because often the simulator is not sufficiently representative of the real world. And so the skills you learn in simulation actually don't work in the real world. You might say, okay, how to solve this? Well, maybe we build really realistic simulators that look like the real world, feel like the real world. Maybe that'll solve the problem. And definitely people are trying very hard, but it's still far from a solved problem to make simulation really match the real world. Here's another approach um, that has shown a good amount of promise, which is called domain confusion or domain adaptation. The idea is actually as follows. Imagine you're going to train your neural network, sometimes in simulation, sometimes in the real world, but mostly in simulation. 
because that's what's easy to train. Then you might say, well, what's going to happen now when it's doing that kind of training? Um, how do we know what it learns in simulation is going to carry over to the real world that's going to share enough? What you can do is you can say after a few layers of processing inside a neural network, it should be impossible to recover whether the observation came from simulation or real world. If you can ensure that by an adversarial objective in that layer that's trying to erase information about real world versus sim, then from then onwards, everything you learn is perfectly shared between sim and real. Is there a downside to it? Well, the downside is that you're trying to erase information at that spot, and that's a bit of a force acting against what you're trying to do, which is extracting information. So it's non-trivial in many ways to train this, but principally it's sound. If you erase the information there, everything after will be shared between sim and real. Here's another approach I want to mention, the one that we've been pushing pretty hard in the past few years, which is domain randomization. So in domain randomization, the idea is that something is very, very simple. If the model sees enough simulated variation, the real world may look like just the next simulator. So everything shown on the left is simulated. None of it looks realistic compared to the picture on the right. But the hope is that if we introduce enough variation, different lighting conditions, different viewpoints, different occluders, different textures, different colors, at some point, the only signal you can pick up on from learning in that simulator is the thing that is also in the real world. In this case, it's about finding the hexagonal shape and picking up the hexagonal block. Has this been done before? Uh, a little before our work, um, Fresh Sadega and Sergey Levin showed that for quadcopter navigation, it was good enough to train in these environments to be able to get the quadcopter to learn in the real world to steer towards open space. Now, finding a specific object is a lot more precise a task to complete than going to open space. And this work required or did pre-training on ImageNet, so it wasn't fully trained in simulation. And the simulator is a little more realistic than what we're shooting for. We're curious, can we do it without pre-training on ImageNet? Can we do it in simulations that are not nearly as realistic? And can we do it for a precision task like picking up an object, finding it first, and then picking it up? The beauty, by the way, of this kind of unrealistic looking simulation is that you can render scenes extremely quickly. In fact, we never use the same scene twice. We don't generate training data and then cycle over it. Just on the fly, as we want to feed new data, we just render it and on the fly, then feed it in once, one training update on it, and then next time it'll be new data coming in. How well does it work? On the horizontal axis here is the number of training samples, which are all simulated in thousands of images. Vertical axis is the average error in localization of the block on a table. And we see that it drives it down to about 1.5 centimeters, which for a monocular camera is the kind of precision you often get after really careful calibration. So see, it's driving it down to what we can expect if you really learn fully what's there. This is just localizing. How about grasping? Grasping is a very hard problem. Um, you can say, well, that means we need a lot of data. Can we generate a lot of simulated data? Well, simulation is not super precise necessarily for grasping. And we don't have a lot of objects for which we have models. ShapeNet has a few thousand models, um, but is that really enough? No, you need a lot more. So what we did is we took the ShapeNet models and we randomly sliced them up into subshapes and then randomly recompose them together in new objects. So what we have is a very large, infinite set of objects we can generate now where the local properties are coming from real objects, but globally it's a new object compared to anything else seen before. We train on that to predict grass poses, and then without any real world training, um, here's what we get. So see the robot reliably picking up objects from the table, even though it's never done anything in the real world before. Now, by no means this is a solved problem, by the way, grasping remains a hard problem to get to full like, you know, 99.9999% reliability, but I think it's, at least at the time, very surprising that purely training in simulation can get you reliable grass point prediction on real objects. 
This is just grass point prediction. How about dynamics? So when you have a robot in simulation, um, a lot of things will be mismatched with the real world. You might have different mass properties, damping, friction, um, measurements. There might be other things like backlash that you aren't really modeling exactly right and so forth. Can we randomize in our simulator over enough versions of these parameters such that if we learn something that works in our simulator across all instantiations, it'll also work in the real world? Well, it turns out we couldn't do that. So if you try to train something that works across many, many settings of these parameters, it, it's just too wide a range of simulation environments that not a single policy will be able to succeed at all of them. We can do something slightly different. So instead of training something that's robust to all, we can train something adaptive. So we train a recurrent neural network that as it starts executing, through the hidden units, gets to adapt to the specifics of the environment, and in that way, can be ready also to adapt to the real world. So train it in enough simulators, such that when you go to real world, you're used to adapting to new things, and it's just now real world or simulation, you don't care, you're just adapting and learning to do the right thing. On the right here, you'll see the best simulator we had. Well, we trained in the best simulator we had and then tested on the real world. You'll see it doesn't work. It's supposed to push an object around, but the friction forces are very hard to model, and so it's not gonna succeed Whereas on the left, it's been trained in an adaptive way. It's adapting as it's interacting with the world and is able to get the object to the target. Now on the right, well, it just struggles because its model is too mismatched with the real world and so it doesn't uh, get the job done. How far can we take this? Well, after the, the previous project um, at OpenAI, this was taken to a whole other level of scale with building simulators, many, many simulators, variations of simulators on how a hand and in-hand manipulation is modeled. Train a neural network to be able to adapt very quickly to whatever new simulator it's in, and then ultimately apply that in the real world and see how quickly it adapts. And indeed, we saw that it was capable of learning to reorient the block in hand to the target location shown here. And this required an amount of training that you could never run on the real hand. There's you know, many, many, many um, simulators in parallel for a very long time to get to this level of performance, but that's fine because simulators are easy to get. Getting many real robotic hands is very expensive to get. Okay, so so far we covered few shot RL and leveraging simulation. Now we'll take a look at model-based RL, and we'll actually bring back in both of those concepts very soon. So in reinforcement learning, we have an agent interacting with the world and it's supposed to optimize reward based on repeated interaction. So it's really supposed to learn from interacting with the environment. How does it learn? In model-free RL, it learns from directly taking interaction data and internalizing it into a policy or a queue function. But there's an alternative. The alternative is model-based RL. You interact with the real world. You don't take that trace of interaction to internalize into policy or queue function. You take it to build a simulator, to learn a simulator. Then in the learned environment simulator, you might run RL, optimize your policy or queue function, then go back to the real world and repeat. So canonical model-based RL looks something like this. We're going to iterate. We're going to collect data under the current policy. We're going to improve the learned simulator from all the past data. And then we're going to improve the policy in the learned simulator and repeat. What's the anticipated benefit? Well, much better sample efficiency. Because you use your data to build a simulator and then you can do a lot of learning in that simulator. So why is it not used all the time? Well, the main reason is that it's not been achieving the same asymptotic performance as model-free methods. So in model-based, you see your learning curve shoot up and then saturate. In model-free, it would take forever, but then when it finally starts going up, creeping up, it'll creep right past the performance of model-based and get to a better level. It'll take you know, 10, 100, 1,000 times longer, but it'll get to a better level. OK, so why might this be happening? Um, the underlying cause is something called overfitting, but it's a very special kind of overfitting. 
So standard overfitting, which happens in supervised learning, is that you train on training data, you have really good performance on training data, you test on test data, and it doesn't match up. It's much worse. So you memorize the training data rather than learning the pattern. This can happen in model-based RL, by the way. You could have your data, train on it to learn your model, your simulator, and then it might have overfitted that data. So we should not do that. And that's easy to avoid. We take some validation data, we train until we kind of saturate on validation data, and then stop training. So let's assume we do this right. There's going to be another kind of overfitting that kicks in, a new challenge. What happens is, is the policy optimization that's happening in the simulator that ends up, ends up exploiting weaknesses in the simulator. Things that are not true in the real world, but in the simulation allow you to get a lot of reward. And this, in real world, often leads to catastrophic failures. This is often called model bias, and it's really this overfitting of the policy as you optimize it to your simulator in regions where the simulator is not precise. You might say, well, just learn a better model. Um, shouldn't that resolve it? But that's proven largely insufficient uh, thus far. So what else can we do? Well, what if we can not learn a good enough model, um, yet still want to get really good performance? We've seen the solution. Domain randomization was an approach to have a wide range of simulators, none of them precise, but together capturing enough about the world to get the job done. So we should be able to reuse that idea. So key idea here is, let's just forgo the notion of learning an accurate model. We should try our best, but let's not require it. Let's just try our best. It might not happen. Then we'll say it suffices to learn a set of models representative of the real world. Instead of learning one neural net simulator of the world, you might learn 10 or 100. And then on this set of simulators, we run few-shot reinforcement learning such that our policy is ready to adapt to any new simulator and hopefully ready to adapt to the real world and do well there. So what does it look like now? Again, we're going to iterate. We're going to collect data under the current policy. Just read it as current policy for now. I'll say more about that little detail later. Then from the data collected under the current policy, we learn an ensemble of case simulators from all past data. In our experience, often 10 is enough. Um, how do you learn an ensemble? Um, traditionally, you would often learn an ensemble by training on different subsets of the data. With large neural nets, what seems most effective is you just um, initialize them differently, and you let them all still use all the data. You just, your different initialization will have them end up in different spaces, because if the data doesn't cover a certain regime, if it's initialized differently, they'll have different decisions for that part. Then we run the learning to learn meta policy optimization over this ensemble. We'll get our meta policy. This policy is ready to adapt to any new simulator, including real world. We could take that to the real world, collect data and repeat. It turns out it works even better if you then adapt to your case simulators just a little bit and then take those policies to the real world. Why? Now you have a diverse set of policies going into the real world, which will do better exploration than if you just use that one policy and let it adapt. And so you'll get better data to learn simulators from and repeat. Okay, we evaluated this on a range of Mujoko environments, the kind of canonical environments. Let's take a look. So here on the left, we see MBMPO, the method I just explained. And on the right, PPO, proximal policy optimization, which is a state-of-the-art model-free method. By the way, the MBMPO, the meta-learning under the hood also uses PPO, but it uses PPO for learning to learn rather than for the final learning. And we see that in about 45 minutes of experience, the model-based meta-policy optimization is able to learn a great policy, whereas PPO was still stuck in its early exploration phases. This was half cheetah, same story for the two-legged walker, uh, or 2D walker, and for the um, ant robot. Again, in about 45 minutes of interaction with the world, in this case a simulated world, it can learn to control the robot with this new method, whereas model-free methods would take a lot longer. Let's quantify this. So these are learning curves. Horizontal axis, number of time steps of interaction with the world on a logarithmic scale, so 10 to the 4, 10 to the 5, and so forth. Vertical axis is average performance. And we see in red the approach I just explained. 
And in other colors, uh, the kind of canonical state-of-the-art model-free methods. What we see is that model-based learns a lot faster, nothing new there. I mean, if model-based doesn't learn faster, what are you even doing with your model-based algorithm? It should learn faster. What's special about these plots here for the first time, we see model-based achieve the same asymptotic performance as model-free. It goes right to that level, uh, the same level model-free gets to for all of them, and has about 10 to 100, sometimes 1,000 times better sample complexity. The previous state-of-the-art and model-based was um, a method that one of my other students developed in Art Courage. You looked at um, using a model ensemble also, but learning a robust policy against the ensemble rather than learning an adaptive policy, and that's shown in blue here. So we see that we do get a very distinct benefit from learning an adaptive policy shown in red over a robust policy shown in blue. We can also now get this to work on real robots. So here is PR2 robot. Um, learning to stack the Lego block and in about 10 to 15 minutes of real world experience it's figuring out to put the block onto the target. The reward function here is distance to the target location um, and of course the hard part is getting the last bits in place where there's a lot of contact forces. On the right, model free um, same amount of experience, but hasn't learned anything really yet. All right, so one of the big challenges in reinforcement learning is exploration. Um, you need to experience things you've never experienced before, such that you can learn from that and consolidate that into a good strategy. Traditionally, exploration is done by just putting some noise on your actions. So your output of the neural net will have some noise on it, Gaussian noise, or maybe it's a um, discrete random variable with a distribution you sample from it. What works often slightly better is to do parameter space perturbation. Why might that work better? Well, if you perturb your parameters and then run an episode with the perturbed parameters, you get a consistent different strategy as opposed to a noisy perturbation independent at each time step. And so you might get Maybe your robot has to run down a hallway. If you just do random actions, it's a random walk. You might never get to the ends. But if you perturb your parameters, you might always run to the left, always run to the right. And that way, you might explore a lot more quickly. Still, it's not a very um, deliberate or um, interesting exploration strategy. And it still requires a lot of samples. People improve upon this a bit by having exploration bonuses. Exploration bonuses is where you, when you experience something new, you've not experienced before, and it can be measured in many ways. It could be a state you've not been to or not frequently. It could be you're learning a dynamics model, and the dynamics model made the wrong predictions, so you didn't understand this part of the world yet. Then you give a bonus. And when you get a bonus, it'll effectively say, OK, I should go there again in the future, because something new is in that area. But that's after the fact. That's after you manage to find something new. It'll tell you this was something new. Maybe you should go here again to learn more about it. It's useful. But it's not that deliberate the way humans would explore. Humans would look around and say, that might be something interesting to try. This is just after the fact. It was something inter interesting. I tried. I should try it again. So can we explore in a more informed way? And just a heads up, we're not going to uh, fully solve this in any way, but we have a little bit of progress here. So imagine you have a robot, and it's in this world, and imagine the robot is blind, cannot see anything, it just has, it knows its state, but doesn't see the environment. And always, there is something to collect on that semicircle, but only one spot on the semicircle has the reward. And when you get dropped in the environment again, it'll be in a different spot, you know, don't know where it is, but it's going to be somewhere on that semicircle. Well, if you just do random actions, first of all, the robot will mostly fall over if you do random actions. But let's say it's learned to run somehow, and you randomly run around. Well, then you will still take a long time before you visit the right spot on the semicircle, because you don't favor the semicircle. What you would want is a strategy that says the semicircle is interesting. I should go there a lot. Um, how do we achieve that? Same thing for a wheeled robot. Same exact formulation. If the reward is always going to be on the semicircle, but you can't see it, you can only experience it once you're there, how do you have a strategy that exploits that? Or imagine a robot that's interacting with objects. If you do random actions, the robot will just wave around and will not even touch any objects most of the time. But if you know the objects are the interesting thing, can you make sure it actually interacts with the objects? Or for this task, 
an object has to be pushed onto the red target spot in the back. So the right exploration strategy would be, I don't know which object should be pushed there, but I should push one of them, see if it's a reward. If it is, push it again and again and again. If it's no reward, let me push another one. Until you finally find the one that gives you a reward and keep repeating. But again, random exploration is not going to do that. Um, exploration bonuses are not going to do that in any reasonable amount of time. So, what can we do? Um, one idea we've been pushing is latent exploration space. So the idea is that, what if we can learn a latent representation for behaviors? Just like people learn latent representations for images, but here it's for behaviors. And so if you have behaviors in the past that were useful, then you could maybe put a lot of probability mass on the behaviors that were useful, and then when you try to explore, you sample from that distribution to generate a behavior that has proven useful in the past and see if it's useful again now. Note it's very different from most of the representation learning work in RL or other parts of machine learning, where it's about taking an observation, which is, let's say, pixels, and turning it into state. That's still important, by the way, right? I mean, if you have an image, megapixel image, one million variables coming in, and the underlying state of the system is 20-dimensional, if you can go from observation, million-dimensional, to 20-dimensional, you're probably going to learn a lot faster. And there's a lot of good work going in that direction. But here I want to talk about something else. I want to talk about the notion that we should also learn representations for behaviors. To understand what's a good behavior, what's a not so interesting behavior. First approach I want to cover uh, is by Carol Hausman and collaborators at uh, DeepMind. They said, well, here's one way to get this done. Um, let's, take, let's break this down for a moment. So we have a policy pi theta that we're going to be using will still output actions. It'll see the state or some observation. But then it's going to take in a discrete representation, an index, into the task the robot is supposed to solve. So we're going to have a lot of tasks. It's going to be told which task to solve. So in the case of the semicircle, it would be you're told the target is at 1 degree, or the target is at 5 degrees, or the target is at 10 degrees. It's being explicitly fed into this thing here, a label of the task you're supposed to solve. And then you run reinforcement learning, the normal way, but you learn a policy that generalizes across all tasks. So no matter what discrete code is being fed in, you're like, okay, um, it's five degrees this time, I know where to go. Now, the special thing, special trick played here is that this D is then embedded into a latent space that has to come from a Gaussian. Why is that interesting? When you now have a new situation, and you're not told, well, what is the degree at which the reward is positioned, or which block is the one I'm supposed to push, you can sample from a Gaussian and feed that in and get one of the behaviors that you've been training as successful in the past. And so through sampling from the Gaussian, you get to index into your behaviors, get something out. Now to ensure that there's a wide spread of behaviors, there's also a mutual information objective between trajectory that results from this and the Gaussian variable here. Now, the one thing that's happening here, though, is that you need to, essentially, you need to describe a wide range of tasks, and then you hope that after you're done with this, that for a new task, where it's at a new angle you've never seen before, that you'll sample accordingly, and it might just work out. Can we take this a step further? Can we somehow ask it to succeed? Meaning, can we say we want to train on a set of tasks so that in the future, if we have a new task, we have the right exploratory behavior. So much like the learning to learn in the maze, we're not learning to solve this one maze, we're learning to be ready to solve future mazes. Can we do the same thing here for exploration behaviors? Actually, we can do it this way. So we'll say, still a policy, still latent code Z, still state or observation going in, this is all the same, everything else disappeared. But some machinery is put around it. Um, around it, we're doing learning to learn. So the way we train this now is we say we're going to get 100, we're in a new environment, we sample 100 different Zs. We generate 100 trajectories as a consequence. After those 100 trajectories were generated, we do a policy gradient update and look at the policy after the policy gradient update and how much reward that policy gets. If that policy gets high reward, then it means we, these 100 behaviors that we sampled had something interesting in them, interesting enough 
for a policy gradient update, which is a specific mechanism to extract it and find a good policy. Now the procedure I described has learning in it, but can actually differentiate through the whole thing. So you can end-to-end -end differentiate through this whole process and learn a pi theta such that the process I just described tends to be successful. So, let's look at our task again. These are our three task families that we're looking at. What behaviors do we get? First, let's, let's look at some results. Top row, on the left we have legged locomotion, then wheel locomotion, robotic manipulation. In blue is Mason, M-A-E-S-N, the approach I just described. You sample a bunch of trajectories, do a policy gradient update, and because the representation you learned, what you sample is interesting and the policy gradient update succeeds. Let's look at the, and the other algorithms of course learn more slowly because they don't have the ability to learn to explore. They are exploring maybe with exploration bonuses or random exploration and that does not incorporate the kind of information you need to learn a lot more quickly. The bottom here we see trajectories. We see some trajectories and follows when sampling a Z code. Some trajectories uh, for different Z codes for the wheeled robot and for the pusher. So we see that indeed ant explores the semicircle. We see that wheeled robot explores the semicircle. And we see that the pusher indeed moves forward and will have a block pushed into the goal location and find out whether it's the right one or not. Now, if you're thinking very, very carefully, you might wonder um, why are these trajectories random like this? Why is it not the case that a trajectory is essentially go to the edge of the semicircle? run along the semicircle, and so every trajectory gets the information you need. My hunch is if we set up the same thing with Q learning, you might get this behavior out. With policy gradients, if you run along the semicircle, and then from that experience do a policy gradient update, it will not extract enough information, not enough signal there, because it got reward, but somewhere, and is that somehow tied up to actions it took, is not going to figure it out. Whereas with straight shooting, to the semicircle, the one trajectory where you're successful has all the signal that this behavior was the perfect behavior essentially. The policy gradient update will reinforce it and you're good to go. So in this case, I think it's an artifact of a on policy method that we get these behaviors um, as a way to explore because that's a way we can learn quickly from the data. So, so far we've seen two approaches to learn latent representations of behaviors. But so far, it's required to first have a bunch of tasks, train against those tasks, either just train against them on the left, or train to explore in those environments, so you're ready to explore in a new environment on the right. Can we do this unsupervised? Can we just be, like have a robot be in an environment and learn behaviors that might be useful for the future? Well, it can actually be done. And the formulation is very, very similar. Same as we had before. Latent code going in, indexing into behaviors. Then here is this mutual information term between trajectory and latent code. And if you ensure there's enough mutual information here, it becomes part of your objective, then it means that by choosing a different latent code, you get a distinct behavior out. And so you're not doing random actions anymore, you're doing random behaviors to explore. And so now how do you measure the mutual information? Four different papers, four different ways of measuring it. This paper measures it actually from the discrete uh, code rather than uh, Z code. Variational intrinsic control looks at the final state in the trajectory and only looks at that for the information. Um, diversity is all you need, looks at the sum over all states along the trajectory and of mutual information. And then Valor looks at uh, joint mutual information between latent code and entire trajectory. Um, I would say that these details are maybe less relevant than the high-level concept because they all kind of give the same results anyway. It's about the notion that if you can learn a representation so you can index into diverse behaviors, you can then reuse that to explore more effectively later. And so here it is from the diversity is all you need paper, different Z's leading to different behaviors. It's a little bit cherry-picked in that it's not that it was only four Z's sampled and these are the four that came out, but you pick a few 10 Z's and then from among those few 10, you actually do get a very nice range of behaviors showcased here. Okay, so the last challenge I want to touch upon is few-shot imitation learning. 
Imitation learning has a long history in robotics. Um, many, many results have been obtained that way. But if you look at the details, imitation learning tends to be get a lot of demonstrations, some imitation learning algorithm runs, and then hopefully a policy comes out that's good. Let's say you get a lot of demonstrations for assembling a chair, policy comes out for assembling a chair. A lot of demonstrations for assembling a table, policy comes out for assembling a table. Um, and you keep repeating that for every new task. Contrast that with humans. When humans are shown how to do something, you can just show it once. Show something once, they get it. They might have to practice a little bit, but they get it. They get enough information from one demo to understand what they're supposed to do and then get it done. So, can we do the same thing here? Maybe meta learn against. Can we have many demonstrations for many tasks? From that, internalize what it means to complete a task. And then, from that internalization, just one demonstration should be enough to imitate something new. Or something else new. So here I'm going to present two different approaches to solving this problem. And solving is probably a better phrase as making some progress on these problems. And I really don't know which one five years from now people are more likely to have mostly built upon. I think both look very promising and probably combinations of them will be even better than any single one of them. Um, but yeah, we'll find out in the future. So I'm going to explain both ideas to you. First idea is, well, if at training time, I get two demonstrations for each task. Then I can train my neural net as follows. I can say at training time, I have two demos. One demo, I have the entire video available right now to feed into my neural net. That's on the left. Entire video goes in the neural net. On the right, I have one frame of that demonstration. And I'm supposed to predict the action taken. Why should I be able to do that? Well, the neural net should look at the current frame and say, well, this frame looks very similar to maybe some frame in the demonstration video. Index into it, see what's similar, see what happened next, and then make the same next thing happen on the right. And then the next frame is exposed, and you repeat over and over and over. So if your neural net can succeed at this, then if at test time you only get one demo, that's enough. Because then you get your one demo to index into, you get your current scene, and you then index it into your demo, Take the action that you predict and repeat, repeat, repeat. Under the hood, I mean, you need to put a little more than just a gigantic black box. There's a convolutional net processing the frames that goes to RNN, that goes to a multi-layer perceptron that also then compares it with the CNN on the other side, and out comes a motor torque prediction. The task we looked at is block stacking. Um, I'd say why block stacking? Well, you really need a family of tasks for something like this, because you're going to train on many demonstrations in the past to quickly learn something new in the future. It'd be nice, I mean, an ideal task might be, you know, IKEA furniture assembly, and you demo every possible, no, maybe 200 things of IKEA assembly, and then it can do every next one. That's still a little hard to do, but maybe in the future. This is kind of a simple version of that. Um, there's a bunch of blocks, and the task is defined by how the blocks end up, A on B on C on D. That's the task definition in our minds. It doesn't matter the coordinates of the blocks. It just has to be on the table, stacked the way they were in the one demonstration you'll get. We're not telling the recurrent neural net that. We're not telling it anything about that. But it's supposed to extract that, understand if these are paired demonstrations, and one of them ends up in that corner of the table, the other one in that corner of the table, clearly the coordinates don't matter. It's the relative positioning of the blocks that matters. We gave it a bunch of pairs of demonstrations, trained this one-shot imita imitation learner, um, and then here it is in action. On the left is the video that's the one demo for this um, task. Below it, you see attention at different times. So the neural net can index into all times. We're watching the video linearly, but the neural net is looking at many, many times in the video at the same time, making sense of what is relevant for the current situation, then acting based on that over here, and here you see highlighted attention to blocks. So right now, paying a lot of attention to block I and J. Um, a lot of attention to I and J. It's placing I onto J, and I think that's on, and then now H onto I, and I think that's the last one, completes the task. Now, this is one way to do it. It's a very black box approach and seems to work quite well for tasks like this. Here's another approach. 
Um, we're going to start from a very different starting point. Computer vision practice. What do people do? Well, you train on ImageNet, and then you fine-tune on what you really care about. It actually works really well. So you might have some questions about this, though. Um, well, how to generalize this to behavior learning? Because there's nothing about behaviors there. It's about images. And then how can you train to guarantee success rather than just train and hope things will transfer? Can you force transfer? Well, the key idea is that we're going to end-to-end learn a parameter vector theta that is a good initialization for fine-tuning on many future tasks. What is fine-tuning? In fine-tuning, you have pre-trained parameter vectors, and then you have some new data coming in. You look at the loss on that data, take the gradient of the loss with respect to the parameters, and do an update. It's just a standard learning update. Result, fine-tuned parameter vector. If fine-tuning works, what that means is that Theta prime works for your problem. OK, how can we find a theta that will ensure that theta prime is good? Well, what if you have many tasks? And for now, you can just think of it as supervised learning tasks. Let's say we have many supervised learning tasks on images. Many, many supervised learning tasks on images. Well, we index into those tasks by index i. And for each task, we have training data, validation data. We have our current parameter vector theta. We do a gradient update on the training data for task i, and we check loss on validation data. If that loss is a good loss that we're happy with, then fine-tuning worked, and our pre-trained theta was a good one. If that's true for all of the tasks, we have a theta that might also generalize to tasks that are not in our training set, but test tasks we've never seen before. Might just generalize with one gradient update. Now, this thing, again, has learning on the inside, but nevertheless, you can actually differentiate through this whole thing to directly do gradient optimization to find a parameter vector theta that is good at this objective. And then, hopefully, we'll be good at the objective that you care about at test time, which is doing the same thing for a test task. Pictorially, you can also think about it this way. Um, this is our objective. We want to meta-learn some parameter vector. Um, there are many, many tasks. Each of them has their own optimal parameter vectors and want to position ourselves in a way that we're ready to jump on to whatever is optimal for different tasks. All right. Um, if we want to do this for imitation learning, imitation learning, input, image, output, action. That's supervised learning in that formulation. So it's just supervised learning on many, many tasks, having one demonstration as train, one demonstration as validation. You do that on many, many tasks, and then you have a new one demonstration, which is your train. Do a gradient update on that, and then hopefully works well when you execute. Here's this in action. Um, here we have the robot being teleopt to put the apple in the blue bowl. Um, the robot is seeing through its camera. The human teleoperator is also seeing through the robot's camera to make sure the robot sees enough to complete the task. This is the one demo. Now, a gradient update happens to the network, and the resulting policy gets executed. And we said that, indeed, it has learned to pay attention to the blue ball in the image, move towards it, drop the apple into it. So in the demonstrations, the many, many pairs of demonstrations before, it was always, if one demonstration drops in the red ball, the other one also. If one the, the first one drops in the yellow ball, second one also. And it internalized that concept so it can learn it from one demo now. But you might ask, this is kind of tedious. If I have to tally up a robot so I can measure the torques during my demonstration and do this kind of supervised thing that way, yeah, very tedious. I agree. Can we avoid this? Can we just learn from video? So imagine we do the same thing again. But now think about something that's actually much more general than this context. We can have different losses for train and validation. It'll still be a valid objective. So what we can do is we can say our validation loss is still on actions. The validation loss is what we use during learning to learn, when we meta-train the thing. But at test time, when we wanted to do something new from one demo, we don't use the validation loss. We only use the training loss. So that's the thing we want to reduce effort for. So let's make that something else, video prediction. So we're going to say train is video prediction, validation is action taking. I say, well, those are different losses. Why would Optima a gradient update on um, video prediction help you with um, action prediction. 
Well, we're training this joint objective, right? We're trying to find a setting of theta such that if you do a train update on one loss, you get improvement on the other loss. So what does it look like pictorially? We have a network with two heads. One head for the policy loss, action prediction, another head for next frame prediction. And then the hope here is that as we, we train this ahead of time on many, many tasks, that this network will have parameters such that a back propagation through here based on image prediction will lead to correct predictions along that other path automatically. It's trained to try to do that. That's what this objective is saying. Now, I mean, you might have done some uh, prediction of next frame things and you might have noticed that if you do this in robotics tasks, there's so much happening in the scene. And it doesn't really pay attention to what your robot is supposed to be doing. It's like something in the background is trying to predict parts of the background that doesn't do the right thing. Can we change this? So instead of doing just pixel prediction, which is not that great because so many confusers out there, how about we predict the thing that matters? Now what matters? Do you want to go in and say it's the blue ball that matters? Now you're doing all the work again. You don't want to do that. Well, maybe we can learn what matters. So maybe instead of doing next frame prediction, we're going to learn something that further processes that frame into something that determines what's relevant or not relevant. You might have seen this in the context of generic adversarial networks. There's a generator or a discriminator. Think of this as the discriminator, which in GANs defines the loss for the generator. Same thing here. Discriminator defines the loss for this thing. And because it's trained end to end, that loss will make sure you pay attention to things that matter for the task, not other things. Once you do that, this can work. So now the robot is not being teleoperated for the demo. It's just watching this. It watched this, and now things get changed. We did a next frame prediction for all the frames in that demonstration video, and then execute the resulting policy, and it actually works. It knows to drop it into the red ball. So I, I hope one thing is very clear that there's many, many exciting challenges for robotics, uh, in AI for robotics, uh, many, many problems to work on. Um, now one thing that when you look at this, uh, one reaction could be, oh, well, how far along are we with these? Are these now solved? Or there's still a lot of open problems there. Well, few shot reinforcement learning. What did I show you? Learn to navigate a new building, a very simple building of the same type as previous buildings. That is the most advanced learning to reinforcement learn today. That's nowhere near real world scenarios, or maybe just one very narrow real world scenario. How do we widen this up? How to make that work is a wide open problem, a lot of research opportunities. Leveraging simulation, well, it's nice to domain randomize your simulators, but still a lot of work to build them, a lot of work to think through what should I randomize over. We resolved this a little bit with model-based RL, but model-based RL from visual input remains relatively hard, and especially model-based RL on longer time scales remains very hard. You might say, oh, I saw the humanoid run for like, it never falls, but that's not a long time scale. That just means it was doing the same thing for a long time. A long time scale would be something where you don't get to repeat the same thing over and over. You need to do something now that's clearly distinct from what you do next, next, next. You need to build up over a long time different concepts, different procedures to get to a result. Um, wider distribution over tasks for learning representations for exploration. I mean, going to a point on a semicircle is pretty cool, and making sure you push an object is pretty cool. It's a sign of life. It's not exactly a very even remotely close to final result that this is actually working. It's just some signs of life. Few shot imitation. Um, again, task distribution, very narrow. Drop into a cup, and learning which cup matters. Again, it's a sign of life. It's by no means that we solved one-shot imitation. I would have shown you IKEA assembly, cooking new meals. None of that I was able to show, because that's still well out of reach of what I showed you. Another thing is that what I showed here in few shot imitation did not have language in it. Humans, when they teach other humans, they always use language. In fact, even more so language than demonstrations, but usually a combination. And so bringing those together, a lot of open problems there. Now, despite all these open problems, I do believe we can actually already build working systems. Now, we have a little sidetrack here for a moment. Um, and 
say something that I think is going to happen in the next few years. I think for constrained environments like factories and warehouses, I think it'll be possible with the right hard push to solve most um, manipulation tasks, assuming you can do them with either a gripper or a suction. Hands we don't have, but if you do gripper or suction for factories and warehouses, I think things will be within reach. It's actually why, um, aside from the work that I'm doing at Berkeley, started a company, Covariant, two years ago, and that's exactly what we're looking at. Existing automation is largely relying on highly precise repeated motion. And of course, it limits things. Imagine all you do is repeated motion while working somewhere. You're going to have a very limited repertoire of things you can help out with. At this point, I think we can build AI that drastically expands the use cases that can be tackled by robots across a very wide range of industries, logistics, warehousing, shipping, food, car manufacturing, electronics manufacturing, and so forth. And so, a little pitch here, if that's of interest to you, reach out to me. We're always looking for more awesome people to join us, so we are hiring. Um, and that's it for me for this seminar. Thank you. I think we have a couple minutes for questions. Yeah. So the question is, um, when we use cameras, um, can we directly extract, extract depth maybe from a point cloud or something? Um, so I have different, I mean, it depends on what you're trying to do. For some objects, no problem. You get a perfect point cloud back. But for something, something like this, you put that in front of your depth camera, it might just not give you much back. And so I think it really depends. Maybe in your research, your research is not about extracting depth. So you might just use a depth camera to get it all to work together and then it makes a lot of sense. Or maybe your research is about can we find things like this in the scene and then your depth camera will just fail and you'll need to do something else. If you go to real world, um, it's all about the long tail. Like it's whoever is better at solving the long tail of yet another edge case is the one who's going to have the robot that's deployed. And so from the beginning you got to say this has to be feasible. If you can't do this, Ultimately, it's not going to be usable because it's going to encounter too many edge cases it can't handle. And so it depends on the context, but yes? So specifically, what you said in the presentation, there was this uh, slide where we were talking about learning representation for, uh, so there was a semicircle and learning representation behaviors, and you're saying uh, the fact that the behaviors are learned where that you're going directly towards the end, and just you're not going towards one of the end, and doing that is an artifact that your policy gradient method is not policy. If it was not policy method, it would learn to do that. It, so let me, yeah, so I said that the, the reason it's going there is because it's trained such that from a set of first attempts, it samples these, accordingly has a bunch of trajectories, and from those trajectories, they should be able to extract enough signal. But how is it going to use a dedicated policy gradient update to do that? And so the policy gradient update, because of the way it's structured, the credit assignment is not that easy to do. And so by having these exploratory trajectories, the credit assignment becomes a lot easier. Because essentially everything along the path was good or bad, more or less, if you go this way. And so credit assignment becomes easier. Whereas if you have the semicircle running, some things were good, some things were bad, and you need to actually come out with something very different later. And so there you would need a different inner loop method to get that to come out. I said I think it would work if you put something different in the inner loop. We have not done it, and I don't know if it's easy to do, because off policy learning to learn is much much harder than on policy learning to learn. And do you think like, uh, it be an So I think the reason, in principle, an off-policy method could learn to run the semicircle is because an off-policy method can decompose Q-learning, does per-step decomposition of the behavior, and hence might be able to figure out the puzzle of what mattered, and then from that say, actually, this is what mattered, here's where I'm supposed to go. Let's see. Um, Chris. So very early on, you had a very intriguing slide where you said the weights change and the activations change. Mm -hmm. And I didn't understand it. Okay. Uh, the activations aren't states. So how do they, how, how do you learn 
I mean, it, if you were, for example, integrating activations so that there was something that was a state that persisted over time, then I could believe you're learning the activations. Okay, so the question is essentially, can I clarify what's on this slide, right? Well, really, no. It's, can you explain how the human brain works? <laughs> I see. The real question is, how does the human brain work? Yeah, okay. Really Much harder question. <laughs> we have synaptic change on a very low, slow time scale, and we have neurons firing at a very fast time scale. And one of the fundamental questions in neuroscience is, clearly both of those matter. Clearly we go to sleep. Mm -hmm. Clearly we have general anesthesia. How does it all work? And nobody has a, a decent explanation about learning on those two times. Uh -huh. So if you can do it, you can get a Nobel Prize. <laughs> just, a, just, just, a day, just a day late. Huh? Um, let's see. Um, so you're absolutely right that a lot of this is completely unsolved. Um, but the reason I'm phrasing it this way here is the, it's a recurrent neural network. So the activations stay there. They are, act like a state over time, and so you can store things in the activations for a recurrent neural network. So that's the way it stores its recent experience. Activations update very quickly. So that's why we think it can learn quickly by pushing things into activations. Um, there, what, has to, there has to be the equivalent of gradient descent on the activations for you to use the word learn. Oh, let's see. Um, I, th I think maybe then it's a terminology question. When is something learning versus not learning? And um, it, I would say maybe the, the I mean, we, we might disagree or maybe we agree, but either way, I think independent of the terminology, what actually happens is the activations will be specific to the maze that you are currently in. So the activations encode your past experience in the current maze in a way that will help you out with again behaving in that maze you're currently in. Then. After you wake up in the next maze, the activations are erased. So it's a very like, short-term use of what's stored in there. It's not kept for the next maze, because the next maze is going to be different. And so the activations specifically store things to the current maze, not the high-level behavior, which is stored uh, more in the weights, or is stored in the weights, how you adapt um, to new mazes. What's well, the evidence for that? What's the evidence for that? So um, the evidence here is that you are not allowed, we're not allowed to update, well, we're not allowed to update the weights while in a new maze. So we can definitely not store anything in the weights because it has to go into the activations. And so when it, when it does the second run, when it did the second run here, the only way that second run could have been better than the first run is by things it's stored in the activations. That's the only difference it has available, second run versus first run. Should we let Chris go one more time? <laughs> Do you want your grumpy old man comment now? Or <laughs> I still see no evidence that you guys are building on previously learned skills. I mean, you could argue that that latent learned exploratory stuff was the beginning of that. I grant you that. But you guys are still starting from scratch every time. Yeah, so that's a very... Mm -hmm. <laughs> you can't go on like that. I mean, you could. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I think the, the big challenge in building on past pieces is that we need, in some sense, past pieces experience that's relevant for the next experience. And I think right now, we only have this at small scale. So at small scale, we have the notion that if we've been in mazes in the past, we can be better at mazes in the future. If we've had to push something in the past, we can learn more quickly to push it again in the future. Um, I think you're absolutely right. I mean, when I talk about um, wider distribution over tasks, in my mind, that is exactly what needs to happen. That is, you want something that but I don't know, maybe something should be better at cooking because it's already good at cleaning. And those are very different tasks, but wider than anything shown here. And so a lot of, I mean, most opportunity is ahead of us, maybe is the way to put it. Um, 
and especially widening the distribution over tasks is, is the biggest thing we need to figure out. I think uh, we should probably end here, but um, here might be around for two more minutes, but uh, let's take a thing here.